Hi everyone. Um, Rich, we were all muted. Can you hear me now? Um, welcome to this webinar run by Pioneers Post and Good Finance. Um, it's called All Shook Up, Finding the Post-COVID Road to Recovery for Social Enterprises and Social Investors. Our aim today is to explore some of what our leading social entrepreneurs are doing now, um, post-COVID, explore some of their ideas and experiences, and really importantly, talk about the role of social finance in the UK going forward. Um, we know that everyone's time is precious at the moment, particularly, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, we aim for you to go away with some new ideas, some inspiration um, for what you can do in your work to recover from the impacts of the pandemic and to make the most of the opportunities that occur um, for you. And we know how important it is to you that you do your best for your staff, your volunteers, and of course, the people who benefit from your work. I'm Julie Pybus, the Global Editor of Pioneers Post. Um, Pioneers Post is a social enterprise online magazine and um, we say that, that our aim is to deliver the news and set the agenda for the new wave of social entrepreneurs, responsible business leaders and impact investors across the globe. You can find us at pioneerspost.com if you don't know us already. Um, so everyone here, this is, this is your time. Um, make the most of it. Make yourself comfortable. Um, and enjoy listening to the fantastic panelists we've got here today who are really kindly sharing their time and sharing their stories and sharing their ideas for, for all of us. Um, so who we've got? We've got Paula, the founder of The Sewing Rooms. Um, she's got an amazing business brain, so there's lots to learn from her approach to her work. We've got Dave, who's finance director at Chelms Chippy. Um, we spoke the other day and he's revealed that they've got some exciting plans for the future so um, we, we're keen to learn more about them. Um, we've got Fouad who's CEO of ACH. Um, we know he's got some thought-provoking ideas to share with us today um, and we've got our social investor Mike Strong who's business support manager at Live Investment which is also an investor mm. in the sewing rooms. Um, all of our panellists have been finalists or winners in Pioneers Post's Nat, Nat West SE100 awards. Um, so that means they really are leaders in their fields. Um, and also we've got a few people in the background on our teams too. So we've got my colleague Simone who's helping out um, with the chat and making sure pictures happen at the right time and that sort of thing. Our intern Angeline is on our social media. Um, and Festus is going to explain a little bit in the chat about how our audience, you out there, can, can ask questions um, and interact with us. So keep an eye on the chat there and he'll, he'll give you an explanation about that. Um, so over the next 90 minutes, we're going to have a conversation with our panellists, um, explore the effect that the um, COVID pandemic has had on them and their organisations. Um, but more importantly, we want to focus on, on the future, what they're going to do in the next six to 12 months. Um, and we're going to leave half an hour or so for, um, for questions from, from the audience at the end. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I've got to say for now. So I think we can... Um, yeah, Festus is explaining from the Good Finance account there in the chat um, how to use that Q&A function. Um, if you've got any questions as we go along, please just put them and we'll ask you towards the end as well to, to, to um, give us any questions that you have. So, so let's, let's, let's get going. Um, we are going to start with getting each of our panellists just to, to give us a few minutes to explain um, three things maybe that, that have three impacts that the pandemic has had on them and their, how they've reacted to it. So we'll give you all a little bit of background from where all the panellists are, who they are and, and what challenges they face. But then we'll, we'll swiftly move on to um, talking about the future and, and plans for the future. So, 
let's let's get going and shall we start with Dave do you want to tell us a little bit about um, the impact that the pandemic has had on you and your organization please yes uh, thanks Julie um, I'll give a little bit of context on Charman's Fish and Chips uh, first um, essentially it's a social enterprise um, which is under the banner of Charman's Community Enterprises and it's based in um, North Solihull, which is uh, also known as Chelmsley Wood. And um, one of the interesting things that I think needs to be understood is um, Solihull seems to, or gets a uh, press that it's quite affluent. Uh, however, the north of Solihull um, was originally part of Birmingham and is mainly a working class um, um, area and has uh, very many um, difficulties, much like many um, other areas. So it's in the top 10% of de deprived areas, whereas we quite often um, uh, get looked on as being affluent and not needing social enterprises. The concept of um, Chalman's Chippy came about when um, a, a regeneration program was happening in the local area. We were getting new houses, new schools, having the old shops um, demolished and, and rebuilt. And a number of us in the community who have various other organizations sat there and thought, well, when these new units and new shops get built, what are we going to see? We're going to see quite a lot of um, uh, external organizations like, for example, Greg's um, coming in and providing fast food. And could we do something slightly different where we provide something similar? and actually um, try and improve the impact and create and keep the money in the local economy because we all know money going around the local economy is quite a useful uh, impact and it, it generally increases spend. So um, a few organisations, uh, our own organisation development in social enterprise, the Olive Branch Kitchen, um, Three Trees Community Centre and the local Chelmswood Baptist Church got together and said let's see if we can open a fish and chip shop which has some impact so the whole point behind it was to um, try and ensure that we could um, have a traditional business that made money and then we had a significant amount of cash that we could reinvest in the area because as we all know up until then we've been seeing cuts and things so that's uh, and therefore we could reintroduce services that were needed for young people old people etc so that was the concept behind it and it's been now running for quite a while in terms of covid um, we obviously had similar challenges to everybody else in that what we had was a shop um, that was open to the public, we had a lot of um, confusion around about what the virus was, how it was going to affect people, etc. We had a lot of staff anxiety. Um, and whilst we were a, a, a takeout service where we didn't have to close, because of the anxiety, because of the stress, because of the unknowns, we felt that it was best to close the shop, take stock, and work our way through it. So we did actually close for around about uh, eight to nine weeks and we're fully reopened again now. Um, however, what that obviously did was um, dramatically reduce our income and much like everybody else, we had to concentrate on the, um, the cash that was in. Our bills didn't stop as I'm sure everybody else's didn't. Um, we had to continue um, um, putting, obviously paying our bills, paying our suppliers. Uh, and then we had a, a lot of stock that we thought, right, well, this is going to go off. So we thought, well, we need to get it out to um, basically to food banks and to those that were providing support for people who were in in the um, what they call it shielding. So we thought that that was an option there. Um, and obviously, then we also had to look at trying to get hold of the various support packages that had been announced. And I don't know if um, everybody else, when they were announced, it was all oh, right, we can get that. Oh, OK, we can get that. But then as the detail came out, it became a little less likely to be able to, 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 to get those. So we put our staff on furlough, tried to make sure they were um, um, basically able to understand what we were trying to do, that we wanted to reopen. Um, but then obviously um, it was still a matter of the uh, expenditure was far outweighing the income. 
Um, so we decided that we needed to try and come back to work. And what was interesting when we reopened was um, we found that the staff were really open to opening. They really wanted to get back to work. Um, the dust had settled, so to speak. I think some of it was also that obviously they'd been in lockdown um, themselves as everybody else had and hadn't seen anybody, hadn't got out and felt a little bit, um, well, uh, mental health was starting to cause problems. So getting back out to work was really positive for them. So um, essentially, uh, that's what we did. We obviously also looked at applying for all the other types of funds we could include in bounce back loans, which um, have been for this sector a bit of a nightmare. Um, well, for me, it was a nightmare because we couldn't actually access that until literally September um, and it was supposed to be a very quick process so we um, are now reopened it's made us the actual I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna come back to you on on that okay. day because you're on the cusp of telling us the the next phase of, of where you're going to so um, we'll come back to that in a few minutes but what was what was the atmosphere like um, Dave among the managers um, during this time did you feel a sense of calm or um a sense of duty to you, you said about your staff being worried about things. How, how did you all feel? Um, well, there was a definitely a sense of duty to our staff because part of the reason for, for, for it is to employ people and be a good employer. We want to be a good mm -hmm. employer. Mm -hmm. um, so we did have a, a sense of duty to our staff to try and ensure that we secured their jobs, that we tried to make sure they got the funding and, and the furlough and that they were, um, that we explain things to them and their anxiety levels could could be reduced um, in the best way we possibly could but we have to remember that all the directors here are also well they're non-exec so they're also leading other organizations <laughs> so this was on top of having to look at their own staff their own businesses their own um, centers etc um, but it was a very good collective effort and everybody was on pretty much the same page that first and foremost we needed to protect staff support staff and protect our community and support our community as best as we could through the the crisis absolutely okay thank you for that um let's move let's move on to to paula paula can you tell us you've done so much over the past few months um so give us give us a quick run through of of where you were in march and and um then where you got to over the next sort of four months or so. Good afternoon everybody. Yes, um, prior to COVID, or first of all I should say where the, um, I head up the Sewing Grooms, which is a social enterprise operating under the um, kick model and we're based in West Lancashire in Skelmersdale and we um, we just moved into um, fantastic new premises at the beginning of, well, just before uh, November of last year, 2018, 2019. And um, we'd secured social investment loan and um, blended with a grant through First Arc, Liverpool Invest. And um, we had secured contracts with um, a national company that, um, and we were making curtains, soft furnishings for hotel chains. We were also building our domestic market and everything was looking fantastic. We have uh, an academy where we train local people and they actually get the jobs in the manufacturing department. So everybody that's employed with us in our sewing department um, have actually come through our training and so we grow our own staff and that's our model and we trade to tackle um, local issues. So COVID hit and it was almost like the rug had been pulled from underneath our feet. Overnight all of our orders stopped, we had no work from our hotel chain, all the domestic orders stopped and um, we had to look at um, furloughing our staff um, from the middle of March and um, a bit like what Dave said you know we had to conserve what, inc what money we had and really stop money going out through the door while we kind of looked at where our future was. 
And as luck would have it, one of the companies that we work with um, supply the National Health um, Service with um, fabric and um, they've supplied all the, the Nightingale hospitals and they contacted me and they said, Paula, this is the middle of March, just when COVID hit. And they said, Paula, we've got some fabric we'd like to give to you. Um, we're sending you 30 meters and it's antimicrobial um, COVID-19 retardant and it will make fantastic masks and you can make them for your community. So we got, we set about making masks using volunteers um, and we galvanised a whole host of volunteers and we, we started um, making face masks and providing them to um, key workers, care homes. And at that time, if you put yourself back, it was such a stressful time. It was, it was horrendous. We were getting calls every day from people that had no PPE. I was also contacting the government to let them know that, you know, we're only a small social enterprise, but we also could be part of the solution. And we could have been manufacturing and making um, PPE. We know, needless to say, we never heard anything. So that all went by the by. And um, we're making these masks and we're giving them away free of charge to, um, as I say, all these key workers. And then I got together with all my staff and I, I said, look, you know, there's an opportunity here. I think we can make masks and sell them. There's, you know, this is going to last for a long time. And so from the 1st of May, all of my staff have been back at work and we've been making masks and selling them through our website now, uh, Mask Community, to national organisations. We've even gone international actually, we've just made some masks for a company in America. And um, yeah, you know, and for every mask that we make, we give one for free. And that's what we've been doing. And it's it's a really impressive story, Paula. You say things like though, and I think we, we should reflect on this that um, you had a contact who called you up and had the fabric, but you must work hard to build those relationships and to get people to to put their trust in you and your organisation. Yeah, absolutely, Julie. And um, we have a motto: you say what you do, and you do what you say. And in business, you should always never overpromise. You know, we hear all these promises all the time, but if you promise something, you downright absolutely do it. And I think that all of these things are very important when you're building up um, business relationships with your customers. You don't let them down. If there are problems, you nip things in the board and you let them know straight away. And that's how that's how I work and that's how we've developed and developed all of these um, contacts. As I say, we've just made 2000 masks for Peel Ports, um, which was a great, you know, it was a great coup for us to get that contract. And they were all branded with the company's logo and um, they're absolutely delighted with them. And I think so, on the back. Um, so the, you, the, Sewing Rooms actually won the Res Resilience Award in the um, 2020 NatWest SE100 Awards from um, Pioneers Post. So I think it's it's useful to learn things from Paula about resilience and, and what's underlying that success. So thank you for explaining some of those those um, approaches that you use, Paula. Let's let's move on to Fuad. Hi there. Um, can you give us a little bit of background about what ACH does and then, yeah, explain a, a little bit of the impact that the crisis had on you in, in the past few months. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Um, very pleased to be uh, with you this afternoon um, discussing about the road to recovery. <coughs> so ACH is a registered housing association uh, working across West of England and West Midlands and we work with new arriving communities as soon as they get their status uh, from the Home Office and uh, basically we have our business model is made of uh, the initial phase which is about giving somebody a house and the basic resettlement 
uh, what what really ACH specializes on is is uh, the integration phase, uh, and we really help and move on our clients from supported housing into employment and self-employment, which I'll be talking to you in a minute. So we're not your typical housing association. Uh, uh, we we only have about six hundred supported housing units, uh, but we work with actually four thousand. Uh, community members with training and giving them skills and getting people uh, either to uh, start work or their own business. So just before the lockdown, uh, we invested, like you, Paula, in uh, two in very new good offices, this one in Bristol, one in Birmingham. Very likely what we have done, and we've been actually thinking for a long time, is, is agile working. And at some stage, we were you know, within the staff, within the board, there always have been concerns how could we move completely from being a desk-based office to completely moving to agile working. So we invested a lot of money. Uh, everything finished, believe me, uh, February this year. Uh, so in that sense, we were very lucky uh, having all the systems in place um, for um, uh, so that our staff have the capability to work remotely. Um, in terms of what I'd like to show with you, three things that I, I have seen during the lockdown, which actually, um, uh, uh, it, up to some extent, you know, so, so some of the things which uh, I was really excited about was community spirit. Um, the we work with homeless people and we work with other housing associations um, because we work with vulnerable people and a lot of them have not been allowed to leave their houses. You know, that has been quite a challenge of how could we get food, medicine, and things like that to them. Um, we had, you know, the number of volunteers coming to us from the community, from every race, willing to help was uh, something that uh, will really stay with me for the rest of my life. Um, we have distributed two tons of food uh, worth 100,000 pounds um, across Bristol and, 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 and Birmingham. And, you know, uh, in, in terms of our business model, how the uh, pandemic have affected us. A lot of the services that we deliver is, is mainly face-to-face -face in terms of housing and the wider training we do. So we have not been ready to move things into online. And that actually have, uh, like David was saying earlier, uh, uh, have almost killed our income uh, from uh, February. You know, we had classes running where there's thousands of people attending to uh, April, May, with where you know everything has stopped. So again, because we're a community anchor organization, and I can show with you later on how we have engaged the community um, to move things online. There have been a lot of challenges. I just want to conclude with this: moving things online. A lot of the uh, 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 deprived communities that we work with, believe it or not, don't have internet don't have uh, uh, IT facilities and access to internet. And the things that me, you take for granted are, you know, uh, are not there. So if, you know, we want the communities to take part in uh, the economic uh, recovery, then one of the key questions we need to ask is how could we increase the digital training for everyone? Thank you. Thank you for that. That's, that's really interesting. I wanted to ask you, you said um, you were really pleased with how the community came together and, and helped out. How, how do you as a social enterprise build links with that community outside of, of what you're doing to give you, give you those good relationships? Well, first of all, because we are already delivering um, activities to the community. So for example, some of the ways that we've made uh, links very quickly to the community is uh, in Bristol, there's about uh, 4,000 taxi drivers who again, on one day lost all their jobs. And we had a number of hundred small businesses who have closed because we have a uh, business support uh, within our activities. People have come to us asking for help. So we have actually engaged uh, the need of the community and because people have found help, uh, uh, they also were keen to give back to the people who, who uh, in the community who, who were very vulnerable. So um, in, in my view, uh, so some of the services would assume some of the, you know, in, we work with a black and ethnic minority. 
And actually, I, it is not, it's very often I hear uh, this community is hard to reach. Uh, the truth is, uh, we are, we, our offices are within the community. We have a staff with a limited experience and it was easy for us to make the access, uh, to access the community. And because we've done that, it was easy also the community to support us in delivering the activities uh, we were giving to vulnerable people. And um, you were our leadership award winner in um, 29 at the SE 100 awards. Are you, are you there for as a figure in the community or is this something that's sort of more shared among your colleagues as, or is it just solely around you? Uh, I think if you're trying to say is trust important? Yes. This, 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 is, this is all about trust. Um, we, we always, people always ask us, how is it possible that we are not getting, uh, especially in this digital world, a lot of the community is not engaging our services. Uh, and, 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 I, and I think we need to reinvestigate, uh, you know, how you are, you know, getting to the community, or how you advertise into the community and, and you know, and et cetera. So the key thing for us is, is being a community and organization of which we are seen as a community champions. And all of that is mm -hmm. based on trust. Uh, and I hope that trust goes beyond me um, and not, not you know, to, to everybody else in the organization. Yeah, understood. Great. Thank you for that insight into where, where you've been over the past few months. Let's turn to, to our social investor, Mike. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your organization? You better just explain the name change so people yeah. recognize, yeah. Re recognize the organization and sort of maybe, maybe some of the challenges that you've, you've faced over the past few months mm. and how you've been reacting. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I suppose I'll, I'll start by the uh, the name change. So uh, we were Fair Stock Social Investment. Um, that's um, we we've been operating as that for uh, since 2016 when we when we incorporated. Um, but we've recently gone through a rebrand, so we're now uh, Live Investment. So um, apologies if if I do it, you know, um, or anyone else. But um, yeah, so we are now Live Investment. So. <clears throat> uh, my name is Mike Strong, and I'm the business support manager for for Live Investment. Um, we're a social investor based in Nosley in Liverpool, um, and we, we currently provide blended finance of grant and loan up to 150,000 to charities and social enterprises um, across the northwest of England. Um, we, we launched a six million pound fund uh, in 2016, as I said, um, which is funded by Access uh, and through their partners, um, the National Lottery Community Fund and Big Society Capital. Um, and the fund is designed to support organizations sustainability and um, to enable growth and develop additional social impact within the communities that organizations operate um, for us uh, and i suppose our customers obviously the, the covid 19 pandemic has been a challenging time for everyone um, so certainly with sort of mass uncertainty for long periods of time and as i'm sure everyone's kind of felt it it's, it's really hard to understand the lasting impacts that the coronavirus will have and to kind of mitigate any sort of risks associated with it. Um, however, for the, for the past six months, um, we've been working very closely with our existing customers, trying to understand the impacts that lockdown and the government guidelines has, has meant for the organisations and um, as a result, holding regular meetings with them to, to understand the issues, um, especially now as local kind of lockdown restrictions are coming into play, understanding how, how these things can, can impact um, and kind of look to discuss around any ways in which we can kind of reduce those impacts and, and, and look at those um, possibilities. Um, what we've been doing as sort of government support packages and, and grants and things have been announced and, and continue to be announced, we've been able to conduct a lot of research for our customers, you know, understanding they're on the front line, they're doing a lot of Kind of firefighting and um, so we've been looking at things like that and also earlier on you know um furlough i mean <laughs> you know the furlough kind of term was, was relatively new to a lot of people so it was understanding how does that work and what is that um and trying to pull together some some information to to send to our customers so they can apply it where necessary um We've also been able to um, provide repayment holidays with support from our funders to organisations that needed it most. Obviously, financial is you know the financials are you know are very important and have been you know decimated for a lot of organisations. So, 
you know, understanding and, and implementing repayment holidays where, ne where necessary has been really important to those organisations, um, especially for their recovery from coronavirus. And um, perhaps they need to, to look at ways in which they can adapt, um, you know, look at new products and services, very similar to Paula's story from the sewing rooms, you know. Um, and I think it's kind of important to, to maybe mention that there has been a lot of um, creativity, I think, it, you know, is a, um, is a word I'd probably use uh, for a lot of organisations that have been able to, to kind of look and adapt and almost kind of be forced into, the, into this kind of, uh, you know, adapting to, to the coronavirus and maybe look at more digital services or, in Paula's case, you know, look at that supplying those, those face masks, um, which again, you know, it, increases the financials but then also provides that um additional social impact as well um so we've been we've been doing a lot of that we've also been able to um supply some additional grants um which again we, we supported the sewing rooms with um and um and yes yeah, so to, to enable them to kind of you know relook at their models or um be able to to launch new services and new products um but again, you know, it's it's been very much a day by day um, scenario as, as as everyone kind of has felt. You know, no one's kind of got all of the answers, have they? Um, and you know, again, it's that it's that togetherness and that and that work that I think will um, will support everyone out of the out of the crisis, really. And um, thank you for that insight. We we sort of like to think of the sector that we're in as being full of great people who are kind and well-meaning and that sort of thing but it's been an enormously frustrating and difficult and stressful time for people have you found relationships any relationships strained have you found sort of challenges in communicating well with your with your um investees uh, uh, I, th I think so i think you know everyone's you know there's a there's an element of, of stress across the board and, and uncertainty and um we're very much uh, uh, we kind of work very closely with our organizations that we work with so we, we build that relationship very very early on um, so we do kind of want to to understand the good and the bad um, you know when we have sort of our usual catch-up meetings with them you know um, which obviously has been enhanced due to due to the pandemic but yeah I mean I think it's 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 difficult um, for everyone um, given the the, the, the world in which we're living in but I think that as you said before those relationships I think are key you know if you can build those relationships with a social investor or with a, a support organization locally um, I think that will only be a positive thing and um, I've, I've interviewed investees and investors quite a lot and usually I just get to interview the successful ones the ones who've done well but a, a key thing that all of those successful ones do say is is the relationship is key but what a lot say also is that you've got to be honest with each other mm -hmm. and I think maybe some earlier stage social entrepreneurs might try and sort of gild the lily and and sort of pretend things are, are better than they are does that chime with your experience I think so um I think for a lot of our organisations, they've taken on debt finance for the first time. Um, so I suppose it's you know those during those due diligence processes and early on before the investment is is, is approved is is having those conversations around, you know, setting the, the parameters in that sense that you know we are here to work with organisations and not necessarily be a hard faced lender um, and you know only kind of appear when there's an issue um, and I think that's exactly where it's it's key because it's a, you know it's quite alien for a lot of organizations to have this level of of, of debt finance and it's very nerve nerve-wracking especially now um, but that's where we we kind of have that open and honest conversation and, and look at the the good the bad and you know and the ugly really in that sense um, to to kind of understand and get a full rounded picture and then look to maybe implement certain things if if needed Okay, that, that's really interesting insight. And we're going to come back to social, the social investor side of things in a, in a few minutes and look at the ways um, that um, investors might need to change what they're doing in, 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 in our new world. I'm going to turn back to Fouad now and let, let's, look at, let's look at 
the next few months, the road to recovery, um, maybe you can tell us, share with us, Fouad, a little bit about your plans for the next six to 12 months, um, things that you've learned, things that you're going to put in place um, in the near future. What, 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 can we, what can we expect from ACH? Thank you very much, uh, Julia. Um, <clears throat> If, if you don't mind, I, 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 I know you said social investment, you want to go back to it. I just quickly want to share a quick story, uh, uh, especially in response to the question Melanie is asking how social is social investment. Um, we have secured 500k, um, uh, uh, the first Sharia compliant social investment uh, in the UK. Um, and we've been working with our investors for, for quite a bit of time. Like everybody else, when uh, um, you know uh, the COVID nineteen um, pandemic happened, we struggled with with giving back um, the monies. And one thing I would say is, we really need as a sector very clear uh, uh, in in terms of our asks to the investors, uh, and we have to go beyond the uh, all this you know, uh, the notion of we're dealing with vulnerable human beings, can you just help to giving a proper business case to what their money will do. So I, I can show with you, not only did we get a uh, deferral of six months, what we also have got from the social investors is we went back to them and said, we are genuinely struggling in delivering the services uh, that we give to our tenants in terms of housing and training. And we want to move everything digital. And that doesn't, only need huge investment from ACH perspective, but we also need to support our tenants, like as I said earlier, to uh, for internet uh, access to IT and all these things. And that will cost a big amount of money in first shorty space. Could you help? Uh, I'm very pleased to say we have three investors, I don't want to name them here, but two of them actually have given us uh, some money directly to support our tenants. And we've done that because we've been very clear in our ask. Uh, we've explained it, how much impact their money will make and how this will contribute to our, our all the strategy of delivering employment, uh, uh, training skills, getting uh, people back to work and etc. So and what, your question, uh, what, form, what form does that money take, Fred? Uh It was just a grant. Uh, a grant, okay. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't a loan. Um, and, and we did ask for a grant. We said, look guys, this, this, this is a difficult time, but we're not asking you just uh which is fine uh just uh, to give food to our tenants but what we are saying is if you do this the impact will be amazing because we will move things uh, uh, uh so that people can look for work online so people can contribute to meetings like this and um it, it, I, when we were making the proposal julie genuinely we did not know what they will come back these are social investors after all but the answers have been quite positive and uh, two of them have given us money. The third have given us ways we could secure and they have uh, uh, facilitated further discussions with, with other investors. So in my view, in our experience, yes, you know, this, this, this has been really a very good experience from the social uh, investment uh, uh, sector from us. So uh, going forward, um, three things I, I, I again would like to share. One, I think I have covered in terms of moving things uh, online. It's not as easy as it sounds. A lot of almost everything that we have have been, um, you know, uh, have not been ready for this. So moving resources and everything else will actually need huge investment and time. Uh, and, and, and that's one thing we will be working on and um, also working with the communities that we serve become much more online digital uh, is, is very critical. Uh, in terms of uh, because resources are very limited, one thing ACH have done is to work with other partners. So we actually have uh, approached it with uh, WECA, which is our West, you know, West of England authorities, Bristol City Council, uh, Bristol University. We, we brought major players and what we have devised is, 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 is a program which will get two to three thousand businesses uh, uh, either restarted or um, those who are already working, give them the boost that they need. Uh, um, uh, we have made an application to the Home Office and I'm uh, very pleased to say we've been successful with one million pounds uh, 
to 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 work with these businesses in Bristol and the work will start from uh, from from January. One thing that has made us really successful is that we've brought uh, a lot of different people uh, on the table and and, and have discussed uh, again making the business case that that you know if we can have this community this is how the Bristol or, or the, re the region uh, economy can be restarted not only for a specific community and I'm very pleased to say uh, um, you know that you know that money will be coming into the city and making things uh, uh, better. Finally, uh, one thing we always take for granted is our staff, and I think we all have spoken about Paula uh, um, and David about how it's important to look after them, especially in this difficult time. We work with vulnerable people. A lot of our staff are uh, customer facing with this. Uh, um, so the, you know it, it is we, again this is something that we ha have learned very quickly that we had to put support systems in place uh for for our staff and again i'm, I'm happy to discuss that further um but we actually even offered uh, a, a counseling uh sessions individually as well as as a group to support our staff uh, um, 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 with their mental health well-being Okay, thank you for that. Let's let's not go into the details of this right now. But you you've said a few times about making the business case, and does that mean you're measuring your impact and and able to do that? Correct. It's, yeah. it's all about the numbers and uh, showing how everyone but is spent uh, saves money elsewhere and etc. Um, and how uh, what we can quickly show is how the businesses that we've helped with minimum resources have had. Uh, made a major leap forward uh, during the uh, pandemic and, and prior to that. Okay, great. Um, impact measurement is a whole nother webinar, so let's not go into the details. But um, yeah, it's something that's obviously worth an investment in time and effort for you in terms of being able to build your case there. Um, let's move move back to Dave and Dave, tell us. Um, What's going on at Children's Chippy now? You're 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 opening the doors and looking at a bright future, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, essentially, as, as noted, we weren't mandated to close, so it's not um, a major. Um, we, but we felt that we had to for a safety purpose. Um, but we have reopened. What it means is, is that we've reopened on longer hours. And the business has um, fairly much bounced back to very similar levels of trade that we had prior to closing. Now, of course, we have a local community that um, um, want to get their takeout once a week, some of them a few more times than that. But um, they obviously, we do the extra opening hours has meant that we've managed to bring back or come back at more or less the same level because we have seen probably around about 20% of the customers that we used to see not coming in at the moment because of possibly fear, possibly shielding, possibly all sorts of reasons. Um, so that's strong in its own right. And we're starting now to, um, obviously we're paying all our social investment back and things like that at the moment again. Um, I should have mentioned that CAF are the ones who invested us in the first instance and um, they were very helpful over the period of closure. Uh, offering us um, loan holidays and things, whereas the other businesses that we tended to deal with, like the um, the landlord agents, took a, an approach of not talking to anybody and waiting to see what happened. So it was quite an interesting time. But moving forward, um, we we always had this kind of idea that we'd help other communities set up a similar thing if they wanted to. And we've also had a few other ideas bubbling around because we don't want to stand still. We want to create more and more uh, enterprises that can generate some profit that we can literally put back in as physical cash into the communities. Um, so we are expanding uh, or, or, or speeding up our plans to open another chip shop. Um, and we are also um, expanding our plans to open a craft brewery and tap house. Um, because the idea behind commu Chalman's Community Enterprises was also always to have a number of different businesses. But it was also um, the idea, as I think I mentioned before, is, is we wanted to kind of move away from the traditional social enterprise break-even business model and go for um, hitting 
if you like, the com competition that are generally um, profit makers. And obviously we have our own challenges in that, in that we pay our, our staff. An 18 year old will get as much as a 25 year old um, because it's a job that they're providing. Um, so we pay our staff a bit better. We obviously have to deal with taxes and things in a way that some of our competitors don't necessarily. Um, so it's an interesting way forward. So we're aiming now and we're seeking investment and we're talking to uh, 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 investors at the moment around um, blended finance because our original finance wasn't blended. It was pure loans. Um, and obviously we also put some money in as partners ourselves. And that was another challenge for me as, as the financial director of Charmans in that I had other businesses, community businesses and social enterprises that had money locked into the chip shop. They were struggling and they needed their money out of the chip shop. Um, so um, that's where the bounce back loan kind of helped us out essentially. So we're looking forward to kind of um, accelerating our plans to the point where we are, um, it, We've already had high level figures talked at various social investors and we're hoping to get secure the investment that we look at. But I would take Fuad's point that it has to, it has to be a very strong business case because um, at the same token, the investors ideally want their money back and why wouldn't they? Um, but I think um, moving forward, the blended idea, it feels a bit better because it's, there's always been a challenge from, from the people that we work with because we also do quite a lot of investment readiness work as a business, my business, as opposed to Chalman's. Um, there's always a challenge that um, when, when you normally seek investment, you're likely to reap the benefit when you get there. Obviously, in this sector, you're not there to reap the benefit. You're trying to provide a benefit for somebody else. So there's always a bit of a, um, a conundrum there about taking on investment and debt uh, and things like that um, in terms of um, the it essentially. And it's a frustration of mine that the chip shop won't actually provide any money for the community, really, for another two years or so. So it's a long game. It's a long game. So I think we need some more patient um, investment and we need some more blended investment um, because it needs to bring that um, interest rate down in my mind a little bit. Um, although it's a very good interest rate most of the time, um, it's, it's still quite significant when you think that the business is going to kind of um, take some time to pay it back and, and, and ideally um, nobody within the business is actually going to benefit from it. Absolutely. Um, I love, I love all this ambition and the ideas that you, you've obviously got on your team to sort of seek out new opportunities. It's, um, it's really sort of invigorating to, to hear all that. Um, we'll come, we'll talk to, to Mike in a bit about things like patient finance, blended finance and, um, the dreaded question of interest rates, maybe. Um, in the in the meantime, um, let's turn to Paula. Paula, you you've you've gone international. What other plans have you got? Hi, Julie. Um, okay, well, we've been just looking at where we're at now. You know, taking stock, and um, although we are being contacted by you know, the domestic market. So we're getting some customers coming back for be, bespoke curtain making. The hotel uh, is dribs and drabs, nothing like where we were prior to COVID. So we have, um, as I mentioned before, we've got a fantastic, it's a massive big um, uh, place where we're at. The manufacturing department is huge. And um, we, I've always had the SoFab Academy. That was part of what we did. But our courses were all bespoke. We um, designed and ran them, um, created the courses ourselves, and they weren't accredited. So now we feel um, we've got some confidence in this. We're going to set up um, the Academy get um, accreditation for our centre so that we are able to offer um, qualifications within the textile and manufacturing 
um, domain, if you like, we've been approached by some large manufacturers that are having issues around um, workforce trained and uh, workforce that can actually come into their companies and um, you know uh, skill, skilled enough to use the machines and they've asked us if we could train up staff so we've been approaching a number of companies around our area right the way across Lancashire and we feel that there's a real niche there we also feel that there's opportunities around um, individuals that may have you know lose their jobs that might be thinking that they've got skills or latent skills within sewing and textile that they want to develop their own business and so we'd like to develop that kind of thing as well um almost like a mentoring a businesses course and sewing and development so that's that's um there's some of our plans and alongside that we'll still continue to grow our manufacturing department and our domestic market for curtain, curtains and soft furnishings. Now we were able to access some finance to support us to bring in um, external consultants. So we've just got some funding through um, Live Invest supported us in applying for this grant to SIB and um, we've secured this grant now and we're able to bring in some external consultants from a company called New Leaf, New Life and they're going to be working with us to um, you know design a business plan and look at all the financials so we're absolutely um, ready to go. <laughs> why why do you why did you think you needed external consultants to help you with that Paula? Well, I mean, we don't, you don't have all the answers and it's always great to have, you know, um, out other people to, to, to kind of question and, and challenge you for your ideas and just help and put, you know, they, they're experts at actually in finance and, um, you know, that's it. We just felt that we needed that support at this time. And to be honest with you, I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah. I've just not got the time to do it as well because we've got juggling all these different things. So that, you know, that's really, um, it's going to be such a help and such a support to us. That's, that's a great point, isn't it? Because I guess um, a lot of people are going to be feeling the same way, Paula, and maybe um, throwing money at external consultants <laughs> sort of um thinking about how you can um get some help in where you need it just to take some of that stress off you and give you a different perspective is maybe maybe a wise use of of money it's a really interesting point because i bet a lot of people would be reluctant to 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 spend money on something like that but there's there's so many good reasons for it it, it seems yeah, absolutely and um, so we're really excited and looking forward to to working with them and just seeing what the future is going to bring absolutely thank you for those insights into your story let's let's turn to mike mike answer everyone's questions what uh, yeah. <laughs> what does social investment of the next six to 12 months look like how how are you going to make it work for Mm. Our social entrepreneurs absolutely uh, yeah it's a it's, I suppose it's a difficult question isn't it you know and, and one I wish I had a, a magic ball for but um, unfortunately uh, I haven't um, and I've just looked in the comments and obviously everyone's mentioned about uh, SITR and, and social investment tax relief which you know is a um, is, is a good viable option absolutely I think um, you know, as as, so, as you say, social investors, Dave was saying, social investors getting their money back and why wouldn't they? You know, maybe that is a good option for, for a lot of individuals. And what I'd say really on SITR, although it's not something we would, that we directly are involved with, um, I think a good good start, there's a really good kind of explanation of what SITR is on, um, on the Good Finance website as well. Um, a really good understanding of that. Um, however, on, on the other part of, of what Dave was, was talking about as well was um, about patient capital and I think you know maybe that is something which I think needs to be explored a bit more um, I know there are obviously some organizations some social investors already looking at and, and doing patient capital which is 
you know, more longer term piece for our, for instance, our investments are over a five year period um, where, you know, you're looking at the, the £150,000 market, you know, makes it quite um, a big chunk of money really in, in, that, in that respect, you know, depending on individuals and organisations circumstances. Um, so, and, and you know, I, I think there is absolutely that kind of nervousness around debt finance now. Um, you know, certainly I think with the uh, bounce back loan scheme and, and things like that um, coming into play, it's kind of skewed things a little bit with obviously the interest rates being as good as they are, kind of unheard of in this in this sector, absolutely. Um, you know, but obviously they're not around forever. Um, and I think social investment has a, a huge part to play in, in organisations growth. Um, post COVID, you know, when we do get back to a, a relatively normal world, whatever that looks like. Um, so, absolutely, I think that maybe a bit more patient capital will be um, would be suited to kind of keep those repayments down. Um, I suppose there's also maybe one to think about would be maybe like a, a quasi equity um, piece, which is kind of investment structured um, and based and calculated on a percentage of a financial return. Um, and on their revenue streams, which, you know, organizations that kind of maybe struggle with um, with sort of debt finance and, and, a, and a lump sum each month, it might help them kind of, you know, pay as, as, as they kind of grow in that sense. Um, and also organizations that, you know, have a um, different legal structure um, for the likes of equity and things like that. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, and as they were saying, you know, the blended financial uh, approach, you know, of course helps um, having that grant aspect as long alongside the loan, um, I think would, um, it, it is going to be needed. Uh, it, it's going to be a, a very strange kind of over the next six months to see what happens and, and how we do kind of get back to the, the new normal. But um, yeah, I think, you know, maybe something along the lines of uh, additional blended finance more patient capital, quasi-equity stuff, SITR as well. Um, I think they might be key in terms of um, new products and new services for, for growing social enterprises in the future. And have you found, um, Mike, in recent weeks maybe, um, new people coming to you, new social entrepreneurs with new ideas, or has it mainly been contacts from, from your, your existing contacts? Um, a, a mixture of the the two, I think, um, we, 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 for our funding in particular doesn't necessarily look at the startup market. So in terms of new enterprises and new ideas wouldn't be something that we would um, mainly look at anyway. Um, however, for our existing organisations that we work with, there's certainly new ideas. And um, as I say, I think you've said it a couple of times that, you know, there's that kind of wave of creativity, I think, which is being generated, which is, which is great. And, um, although it's, you know, a, a very thin silver lining in a big dark cloud. Um, but th there is, th th there's this kind of togetherness, I, I feel, and, um, and organisations and, and communities kind of pulling together, um, which I think is the right thing. Um, but certainly, you know, we've had, we've had conversations with existing and new organisations, you know, around lending. We have still been doing investments during the, the during the, the lockdown period uh, obviously not as many as um as we would have thought but we still have been um and you know and that kind of takes it back to the i think you know the bounce back loan scheme um obviously that coming out that's been a real benefit to a lot of organizations um absolutely and i think you know it would just be interesting to kind of see how that pans out over the um over the coming years Okay, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I'm going to open this up to our, our attendees who will have, I'm sure, much more in-depth and difficult questions than the ones I've been asking, asking you all. They're, they're the experts. Um, so I think what I can do, or what my colleagues can do, is... Um, open people's microphones to let them ask their own questions. Um, I think that's right. Um, so I know I've got, I've got a question from Ishita from Good Finance. So should we experiment with the tech and see if, and see if that works? Um, Festus, do you, could, can you make that happen? Um. 
Um, I think I I would, but I think she's no longer in the in the session. Oh, okay. In which case, I shall ask the question for her. Um, she was saying, um, she was curious to hear from the panel, um, how have you dealt with uncertainties about the future and questions around revenue streams? So what's that been like on a personal and an organisational level? So would someone like to volunteer from the panel to, to answer that one to start with? I can give it a go. Thank you, Dave. Um, obviously, in terms of the chip shop, um, the revenue is fairly, I mean, we didn't know if people would come back, but the revenue is fairly um, standard to the point where we kind of have the same, almost the same level of customers on a particular day of the week. And there's very little variant um, in terms of what's coming in there. So that's been relatively easy to predict. Um, but from a different point of view, um, in, in my day job, I'm... Um, and I'm glad Paula likes consultants. I'm a social enterprise consultant. Um, and we do a lot of this work. Now, that means we're an infrastructure organization um, and not working directly with individual um, who might be affected with COVID. And therefore found ourselves in, a, in that strange position where none of the emergency funding um, was right. Our, our, our work, which was secured before COVID completely disappeared, much like other people's. Um, and therefore it became quite an interesting, um, well, it's actually very difficult to predict um, when um, various types of funds might come available for people to start to access our kinds of services. Back to the point, though, that you also mentioned before was um, we are, as that kind of organisation, seeing quite a lot of new organisations and people coming forward who have perhaps been furloughed or laid off or whatever and are looking at what can they do. Um, and it's starting to make them think about some of the inequalities that they might have experienced over their time and saying to themselves, well, maybe this is the moment for me to do something about that. And as Mike was saying, though, there is very little um, available from a social finance point of view, from a grant point of view, um, and from an a infrastructure support point of view at a local level. For those kind of individuals, there's just a few programs available. So that in its own right has um, caused us a bit of a, 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 a tricky game from a personal point of view. So I mean, one business we can predict income clearly in another one, it's um, like everybody else searching for new opportunities, searching for um, new ways of doing business, etc. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else from the panel like to add to that? Yeah, I'd just like to add, Julie. Um, I was on a um, School for Social Entrepreneurs program way back nearly 10 years ago, one of the first in Liverpool. And one of the um, sessions was around what comes first, um, the social impact or the business. And I always say the business comes first because if you can't trade and if you haven't got that income and that finance and that money to do all that social good, then you can't do anything. And um, so I always focus on trade, how can we trade? How can we generate income? And that, as, that was always first and foremost with me, which is why, you know, we converted, um, given all, we still give out um, free masks, but we knew we could turn that round and generate income to do more social good. So, you know, that's, that's what I always say, and that's my motto. Business comes first and then everything else will follow. Absolutely. Great advice. Um, did anyone else like to add, would anyone else like to that, add to that one, Fred? Very quickly, um, going back to the basics. Uh, so making sure the, uh, the income streams we had from our established business arm works well, which is our housing. Um, which then gave us uh, the opportunity to trial uh, moving our training arm from class-based delivery to uh, digital learning. Um, the ability to try very quickly to change your business model if it doesn't work is very important and to get how you can get 
on board your senior management, your board, your customers and everything else within the shortest space of time you have. Also, again, it's a very testing um, um, uh, uh, dilemma. So um, I, I think, you know, what we've done really well is going back to the basics and we, 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 we made sure the housing arm of the business is working and that gave us the uh, strength in our cash reserve to try uh, to different things in our training arm. Absolutely, thank you. And um, Melanie Mills has put something um, in the chat that kind of chimes with what, what you're saying there. She said, um, one social entrepreneur said, we must be careful that we don't become a big S for social and only a small E for enterprise. So that, that chimes with what you're saying there. Um, we've got a question on the Q&A from an anonymous person um, who says, um, I'm interested to know from the, the, the panel, how much of the changes you had to make to your business delivery models as a result of COVID? Oh, it's gone. Bestus, what happened? <laughs> there? The question disappeared then, Festus. I can't find it. I can't see it. I was halfway through. Oh, okay. I'm not too sure what happened. <laughs> it was about um, the uh, what what have you done how when while you've changed your business models um over the past few months are, are any of those changes going to carry on through to the future does it permanently affect the way you you're going to work would anyone yep. like to answer that i'll just put it in the chat as well uh i'll try again uh yeah <laughs> i think um <laughs> we we obviously increased our opening hours as i said and we obviously introduced a element of social distancing and various checks and balances on our staff so um we actually asked them to sign every day they come in to say that they their family etc have not received or, or come down with any symptoms etc so they're constantly aware of that obviously greater cleaning routines which is useful within a, a chip shop and fast food environment anyway um, but I think um, a chip shop environment in the back is very, very small. It's very, very difficult, but we've got people um, working in, in, in slight bubbles. And I think we'll probably try and maintain that for some time to come, obviously, because COVID is going to hang around for a bit. But um, um, I think it probably makes good sense longer term anyway, because the biggest risk for that particular business is the staff coming down with something and then also having to shut the, shut the shop again because the staff have have um, the infection and then uh, obviously our insurance would not cover that because it covers other types of business uh, uh, other types of disease but not covid um, so there's a th there are some changes i think we probably engage with our staff a little bit more as as directors as well because we used to leave that to the management staff really um, not to be um, uh, micromanaging but more to be a face that they can see and that they can recognize and that it's seen more as a team um, and who's behind it making the, making the decisions with them rather than about them so those kind of so changes that, that's a, a change for the positive that's that's carrying on forward i think yeah that would be a positive it made us think about staff are obviously um we're too we were perhaps a bit distant from the staff mm -hmm. um as directors um so it's been important for that Great, thank you, thank you, Dave. Anyone else like to add to that one? Not at the minute. I'm going to jump to a really important question because it's coming from DCMS, um, the Government Depart Department for Culture, Media, and it used to be sport and I can't remember what you called it now. I'm sorry, Laura. Laura says, um, she, thank you for sharing your insights. They're, they're, they're really valuable. Um, she wants to hear your key messages for policymakers, government in these times. So this is your big opportunity. <laughs> you've, you've got a hotline to the DCMS. Who wants to say something? Something. Um, I'd just like to say that um, social entrepreneurs are, you know, resilient and, um, you know, we're very engaging and we can be part of any solution, you know, so include us, please, and listen to us and involve us in any 
policy and decision making. I just think it's really, really important. That's all I've got. Can I just add a little? Um, I think yes. over <clears throat> over the over the period, I found, uh, and like many, that. Um, a lot of social enterprises really did fall through the gaps in terms of their understanding and the understanding of support measures that were coming out um, and uh, where they sit. So um, maybe it's slightly controversial for DCMS, but social enterprises are first and foremost the business. And I think we've just heard that business first. Um, and um, we're kind of lumped into this third sector and uh, it's, not, it's not charitable. Um, we're trying to do business with social um, outcomes uh, and I think that stark uh, difference came out in the, in, in the way different types of funding packages came out for various different um, organisations that were not necessarily yet fully understood that it's a business first and foremost, it runs the same as any other business the only difference really is, is what we're doing with the money that we've got left at the end of it. So it's that kind of understanding I think needs to be raised in, um, in many sectors actually. I think it would be really useful from a social investor's point of view and from my point of view as well is that I think there needs to be this collaboration piece really where social investors and um, social investees and DCMS and the likes and the policymakers can kind of pull together to understand I suppose the overall impacts of um, of what's happened and actually what is needed moving forward um, to ensure that the right products and the right services are, are being delivered, um, which I think would be a really interesting conversation to have. And I would, um, I would, I would love to be a part of something like that. Great. Well, my, Vlad, I'm sure you've got something to say there. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, from my point of view, I think um, uh, reiterating what you guys have said, um, uh, at the moment, there's a lot of money uh, being thrown out of the social sector. I'm not complaining. Um, but what would be a really good idea is to make sure government departments are actually talking to each other. Um, uh, the DWB, uh, the training ESF, uh, ESFA, um, uh, the Home Office, all these departments coming together and making sure uh, we're working uh, for the customer. Sometimes what's happening is there's a too small amount of money uh, from one area that is uh, given to the whole country, that's you know it doesn't it doesn't have enough impact. So we need to engage uh, your clinical commission group, is health and well-being, and if we can do a holistic uh, way of funding, um, you know it, it will have a better impact. And what, one of the things also I would really uh, recommend is there are a lot of good uh, best practices around in UK and uh, as Paula was saying, talk to us. If we have done with the small money, huge impact, we know what we're doing. And sometimes it's not about uh, reinventing the wheel, it's about how could we invest what's already working uh, uh, and, and replicate that in the rest of the country by involving not only one department of the, of, 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 of the government, but all departments, uh, for example, uh, how much money we will be saving for the NHS, the criminal justice, and, 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 and everything else. I think with that, we can have a holistic uh, impact. Okay, thank, thank you. There's, there's a comment come up on the chat from Anthea Rossau. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your surname. Um, and she says, yeah, social enterprises have been seen as Cinderella in terms of business in the UK, as in South Africa. Um, and she, she says um, it's what happens to the profits which the government needs to understand going forward. So um, yeah, that's a useful point. Um, Nick Gregory has asked about Brexit. What will replace ESF, that's the European Social Fund, is that right? To reach the most distanced and excluded people. Anyone from our panel got any thoughts on that big hole in our funding? Mm. Um, it's a bit hard to tell because uh, I think when ESF was running out and Brexit was announced, um, there was a commitment from the government to continue ESF projects and indeed the uh, ERDF, which is the European Regional Development Funded Projects, um, and that they would um, continue to support those. Um, 
prior to COVID, I would have thought that there might be a budget that was put aside, um, recognizing that there's uh, investment not going out and then not coming back in. Um, and therefore some investment to replace those funds would have been available. Um, it's a little hard to, to tell what uh, is being thought about at the moment, but um, because a lot of the funds will have to go towards um, um, the, the dealing with the pandemic. However, what we can see with things like the kickstart scheme and uh, some of the, um, the health um, projects that would be needed, social enterprises have quite often occupied that space very well where they're helping people into work they're helping people in health and social care and those kind of things so i think um there is likely to be pots but whether it will be the same level as uh, esf and erdf uh it's a little hard to predict really as with everything to do with brexit at the minute um Laura from DCS, D, sorry, DCMS, which of course is the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, um, has given us her email address. So um, <laughs> we've got the opportunity to, to, to give us some more of our fantastic ideas. So there's, there's a, a great outcome already. Um, so um, in terms of that, that Brexit and the ending of the European funding, Mike, do you think social investors might be able to help step in here or fill some of those holes? I think so. Um, I suppose again, as, as what Dave was saying, I suppose it depends on the origination of the of the funds and where things do come from, you know, to if you know, the RDF and the ESF funding does does go then and, and it's not replaced. Um, again, I appreciate obviously everything's kind of been geared up for um for, for the the kind of recovery during the coronavirus pandemic. But I suppose it's that conversation of what happens next um you know i think is there a need for more is there a need for more social investment I, I think there is um is there maybe a conversation for social investors to have with with um the policy makers and and, and people in, in charge of at government I, I think there is as well um and you know there's 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 really good organizations kind of uh, having those conversations that, that we're working with at the moment as well in, you know, in terms of the lottery and the big sites of capital and, and access foundation. So I think, um, yes, I think social investors and social investment will be a, uh, a part of the, of the future growth and, the, and um, getting back to uh, a stage of normal. Um, I suppose in terms of the funding, uh, again, who, who knows, and in terms of amounts and sizes. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to go from the macro to the micro again. Um, we've got a question from Belinda who says, addressing it to Dave, but I wonder if um, any other of you might have some thoughts on the same subject, actually. You mentioned your costs not going down while the takeaway was closed. Um, and she says, is there a learning, something to learn from here around supply chains and contracts and that sort of thing? Um, something to learn from going, going forward into how you negotiate? with your suppliers? Uh, I, I guess they could be. Um, and I probably need to be very clear about what costs were still there. So the costs that were still there are the kind of standard costs, not the variable costs. Like So essentially, we did obviously not buy um, 13Ks worth of um, supplies every month. But the standard rents, the standard contracts um, that you have to have with pest control, those kinds of things, um, those didn't change whatsoever. Um, so there was, uh, and as the, um, the money that was coming in was only furlough money, that was literally going straight back out to the staff. So it gradually started to reduce what we had. So we did reduce where we could. Uh, and there are some costs that we could, um, we could have perhaps looked at negotiation because we could have had a contract for some of our supplies, which was a one-off fee um over the course of each month but that usually works out more uh, expensive over if if nothing goes wrong um so there are some learning and some uh, and there it is worth thinking through whether we've got the best deal with all our suppliers or not um but most of the costs were related to things that i don't think you could really negotiate once you've got a rent agreement you've got a rent agreement um etc but um it's worth having a look in the in more detail absolutely we we interviewed um 
another one of RSE 100 winners a few months ago called the Point and Sandwich Trust, which operates um, a wind turbines um, in, in Scotland for the community. And um, they were saying they were so pleased that they had negotiated a, a floor price for the electricity they were selling to the grid when they originally did their negotiation because with COVID the electricity prices plummeted. Um, and if they hadn't negotiated that that floor, they would they would have been in, in big trouble. Um, but that's sort of the benefit of hindsight, isn't it? Um, but yeah, there's I I think there's sort of being prepared for the unexpected now um, that perhaps we're going to be a bit more bit more um, open to going forward. Paula, did you have something to add there? It was something about um, when we were talking about, you know, investors and um, I'm thinking that uh, the government can help out as well with social enterprise big time because at the end of every year, any profits that we make uh, are liable for corporation tax. And I just feel like HMRC are no better than the Sheriff of Nottingham because we you know that money that we have to pay back in corporation tax could be doing so much more in our communities and government could be getting added value from you, you know releasing us from that corporation tax um threshold that we have to pay so that was just something that i, I wanted to get off my chest Absolutely. Taxes are an important subject for, for many people. Um, listen, I'm going to start wrapping things up. Um, I don't want to go over time. Um, would any of our panellists like to offer any final thoughts on anything that we've, we've discussed today or anything that you've seen crop up in the chat that we, we haven't addressed? Um, should we go, from, from, go through you one by one? Should we start with Fouad? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Julie. I've really, really enjoyed and I've learned so much uh, uh, from uh, the discussions today. Um, in terms of uh, one of the key things I would like to contribute is that in designing new funding uh, with it is uh, social investment grant uh, blended, we really need to start thinking about how we could include uh, the design uh, people with the lived experience too often what happens is, is when we are designing these things we do it in a dark room away from the customer the person that it benefits the most uh, and I'm really pleased our connect fund um, are actually just doing that uh, 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 and I've got a message here so it's really quite critical that we uh, the customer, uh, the person that we are uh, uh, having impact on is actually sitting part of the table and giving a voice in how, you know, this is not a normal time. How should we actually be supporting them? And, uh, you know, without that, I believe uh, it will be uh, money wasted. Uh, thank you very much once again. I really enjoyed this afternoon. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, involving the the user or the beneficiary, the people that, that we're working yeah. with is, is so, so crucial and something that you can it's so easily lose sight of in the, in the chaos of what else is going on. Dave, any final thoughts from you? Um, my only final thoughts really are more about looking towards the future and those I, I would encourage people to look at. Um, COVID is, is a, the, the, the fallout from COVID and the recovery is really right bang in the middle of a social enterprise space, as I think I've mentioned. So it's about um, looking at how you can diversify a little bit and actually start to address some of those um, inequalities that are coming out. Uh, I'm hoping that we see some um, work around um, the significant inequalities which have been shown bare um during the pandemic actually but i think social enterprises could actually lead the way there i think though we have to recognize that we probably need to do that very much in partnership with the private sector as well as the public sector it's going to be a joint effort it won't be a we can't do it by ourselves essentially and hopefully we can help the private sector understand us better absolutely paula any final thoughts um, just to say thank you for inviting me along this afternoon and I've really enjoyed listening to the discussions and I've learned a lot from my co-hosts and um, panellists and just 
to reiterate what Fawad and, and David said, you know, we, we need to listen more to our beneficiaries and involve them more um, in um, co-production. And definitely the way forward is um, linking in with businesses so they understand our sector and so that they can actually bring us into their supply chains. I think that's really, really, really important as we move forward. Thank you, Paula. Mike? I'm, I'm the lucky one that gets to say I, I agree with what everyone else has said, don't I? So, um, <laughs> no, I think um, I think the guys have, 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 have hit the nail on the head. I think um, you, networks, co-working, again, I think this is something that we're all having to deal with, and I think collaboration is, is key. Um, in, in you know pushing past this so you know it's great to to hear stories from from the guys obviously i work with with, with paula regularly but you know from dave and farad it's it's been really good to understand i suppose the resilience of and give hope to everyone that there is resilience and 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 um, there is a lot of resilient organizations out there um you know and i think um it, it's 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 really interesting to kind of um have the discussion and understand everyone else's kind of impacts um but uh, yeah i think just just thank you for uh, um for, for having me on here and um it's been really really useful i think to um to have the discussion okay thank you so that remains to me to thank the panelists um once again the um social entrepreneurs among us have blown us away with their just their resilience, their ideas, their enthusiasm, their creativity. And um, I was writing a story a little while ago about um, trying to find organisations that were failing or were closing, find, trying to find social enterprises in this position due to the pandemic. And it was hard to find people who were really struggling or had sort of closed the doors and given up because social entrepreneurs haven't given up they're they're pivoting they're finding new directions they're they're sort of exploring new ways and it's such an inspiration to me as a journalist to write about that sort of thing but um i hope we've given inspiration and ideas to all our all our attendees today um thank you to the attendees for sparing your time to to come along to this and and listen to to what we've all been talking about um if um, anyone wants to um, find out more about this or share this with colleagues, we're going to have a recording of this available soon via Pioneers Post and Good Finance, I think, as well. Um, so keep in touch, keep an eye on our social media, keep, keep an eye on our websites, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, there's more on the Pioneers Post website. We've got a whole section about COVID and how organisations have learned from from the pandemic and have changed what they're doing. So do have an explore on, on there. And yeah, I think, I think I'll leave you all with the message um, that, that social enterprise can be part of the solution. So um, yeah, let's, let's work together to try and go forward to a new, a new type of economy, a new type of world, a, a, a better future for everyone. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.